Good evening, everybody. Oh, I have a name tag on because I was just at an event. Uh, it's funny when you go like a drive through a drive through at McDonald's and they're like, hi, David. <laughs> um, welcome tonight to the first lecture out of nine that I'm going to do this year, uh, three in this series right here. I am absolutely honored to have you all sign up and come. And uh, I want to make a few kind of general comments at the beginning. So in, um, first of all, I wore my favorite lecture sweater, okay? <laughs> all right. Um, you'll see the oldies but goodies as I go, right? But this one right here has the exact right, night, right de amount of like heftiness, but not too hot, right? Plus kind of stylish in the shorts, you know, it's just. <laughs> um, so in 2003, I was sitting on my couch um, watching the State of the Union Address, when I could watch the State of the Union Address, <laughs> um, which wasn't a piece of cake then, either, in 2003. And George W. Bush um, made, spent, and I study these things, and so I was doing it as a, as a person who studies this and watches this. And George W. Bush spoke for about uh, 80 minutes or so, and he spent two-thirds of that address making the argument for why the United States needed to invade Iraq. Um, and at the end of that address, um, he said uh, what I think are, if I still remember the number right, 16 words in which he said the liberty we prize in Iraq is not America's gift to Iraq. No, the liberty we prize is not America's gift to Iraq, it is God's gift to humanity. Okay? And I had never done anything around religion and politics as a scholar, as a teacher, as a researcher, but I'd lived in these spaces around faith and uh, certain kind of conceptions of America. And I knew that when I watched that and I saw that and I saw him say that, I literally sat up uh, and said, I think I need to write a book. <laughs> and I'd never written a book. No idea what it meant to write a book. But I just said, I think I have something to say, given who I am as a person, who I am as a, as a person who's come out of certain faith communities, as a scholar, as someone con concerned about this place as a citizen, and where this country and the world's going. And so I did, I wrote a book. And in 2004, the book came out in the middle of, two, in the middle of 2004. And it is a good profession, I didn't know this, but it is a very good professional move to have a book criticizing the president come out in the middle of a presidential election. <laughs> Right? You get a lot of attention, people want to bring you on, and I have a lot of data in my data, so people wanted to bring me on and say, why, do you, why are you arguing this about George Bush and about the religious rhetoric and how this is damaging or dangerous? Um, and I called it then a political fundamentalism. A merger of a religious worldview um, with a certain kind of political ideology that had been put in place that, that, uh, that Bush was enacting. And here's what I concluded then. I concluded that George Bush religiously believed these things, but I wasn't sure if he politically did, but he was a pawn of various people. So he religiously believed this, but not sure politically. I believe we're in a situation now that is the inverse of this, <laughs> in which we have a president who is not even remotely religious. He doesn't know, like, says 2 Corinthians, he goes, well, my favorite book is 2 Corinthians, okay? <laughs> and he says, uh, you know, what, what, what's your favorite passage in the Bible? Oh, they all are, right? They all are. But he's beloved by white evangelicals because he delivers their political goals, right? So this is a guy who I don't think believes it religiously but sees the political value as any huckster and showman does. And he's putting us all at risk, right? And I can say this as, a, as, a, as a, pre, a professor at the University of Washington, which I currently am still, I'm on leave here, but I have greater freedom to say it as someone who's on leave. <laughs> and to say, I could say that, and I would say that, um, but I'm, I'm on leave and I'm doing this work with an organization called Common Purpose, and I'm not only saying this, is what I, which is what I would say as a professor, I'm doing something about it, all right? And I... And I have taught in this room thousands of lectures, public lectures and classroom lectures. Um, 
and I have given so many words, and I feel like this is the year, it is the most important year of my lifetime, and for many of your lifetimes. And so thank you tonight for coming to these lectures. I want you to know that all of the price that you've paid, which I know is a bit, that you've paid is to support the work of a just and inclusive democracy. All right, it is. Um, and so I appreciate that. That's a contribution, that's a donation towards this work. And I will do my best to deliver content that I think drives us forward in ways that um, are educational and also um, catalyzing. Okay? This is the year, it is here, that we will forever remember and answer for as humans and as Americans particularly. So, the title of this lecture series is A New Birth of Freedom, America, Democracy in 2020. And I have to name lecture series in advance because I have to promote them and I have to think, I have to spend months thinking about what there's going to be in the content. Let me, get this, let me say that again. I get to spend months thinking about what's going to be in the content and figuring things out. But I titled this A New Birth of Freedom because in American kind of mythology, the story of America, which is a flawed story to its core. But in the American mythology that nonetheless inspires us in its best moments, the language of a new birth of freedom comes from a particular, particular speech, a particular moment in time. It comes from Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in 1863. And so the, the framing of the entire lecture series is around what Lincoln called us to. We weren't remotely there then. We have a long way to go now. But what he called us to. And the first lecture tonight is to recognize and to spend time in the midst of, of where he was at and what the country faced at that moment as he said those words. And then I will end this first lecture in today. Okay? So the, the uh, oh, I've got to get this all set. A New Birth of Freedom. It's Abraham Lincoln's address. Um, this speech was given at the battlefield of Gettysburg, where there had been a brutal battle in July of 1863. And he went there in November of 1863, five months later, and dedicated the National Military Cemetery that was there. And he was uh, uh, one of two speakers on the platform that day. There was the most famous speaker of this time, this guy, this guy by the name of Edward Everett who spoke for two hours in the cold outside in, no, in Pennsylvania. And then Abraham Lincoln spoke for two minutes. The Gettysburg Address is two minutes long, okay? And this is it in its entirety. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the pr proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. Last bit. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. 
that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Now, if we unpack Abraham Lincoln, he is a very complicated person. Clearly racist, if we were to describe and characterize him from today's possession. Uh, wanted to ship early in his lifetime, early in his political career, many African Americans back to Africa. Um, the story is not always pretty. But it's also a story of a journey of a person. And by the time we get to him in 1863, he's come some distance on this. He had issued the Emancipation Proclamation earlier that year. And he's here to give this address. And there are two phrases in this that me, have, I've carried with me for some many years. One is this new birth of freedom, which is the frame for this entire lecture. And the other one is in the previous bit, last sentence. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. And the story of a progressive America, that sentence can be applied to everybody who has fought for justice and opportunity. Whether it was on the battlefield of Gettysburg or it was on the bridge in Selma, it was at the bar in New York City, it was in the fields of Central Valley, California. The reality is that it is for us, the living, to pursue that new birth of freedom. But here's the truth. The next 18 months from when he gave that address were brutal. Absolutely brutal for all Americans, regardless of race, regardless of sexual, uh, gender, brutal. And the reality is that we are still pursuing that new birth of freedom. It's 2020, and again, we need a new birth of freedom. We do. We do. So I'm going to do nine lectures this year, uh, three in January, three in April, three in uh, September. God willing. That was the title of my first book. <laughs> Still available on Amazon, if I'm just saying, OK? <laughs> the first three lectures I'm calling the Democrats. It's going to be about the Democratic Party, about the presidential nomination contest that's underway right now. It's going to be about, the, it's, today it's going to be about the political landscape. Then it, next lecture will be about the primaries and the caucuses. And then the third lecture, it's going to be about the, con, the, the contenders, the people who are, who are running. The second act of the lectures, which will be in April, are going to be about the Republicans. I usually work a few lectures ahead, and so I'm right now just about finishing the first lecture out of the second act. Um, so I've already got a kind of good sense of where we're going to go with the Republicans. And we're going to talk about Trump, but we're also going to talk about the party and the identity. Okay. And then in Act 3 in September, we're going to talk about the nation, who we are, where we are, and got, uh, I do not know where we will be. There are absolutely no guarantees. You know, I, I sit and I watch the Seahawks, and I get caught up in whether the Seahawks are going to win a playoff game. And my wife asks the logical question, why? <laughs> why? There are no good answers to that question, OK? <laughs> but one decent answer is that the outcome is unknown. And so you live with a certain uh, unknownness for something you're emotionally connected to, and it's unknown. It is all the worse when it's a personal health crisis for someone, and the outcomes are unknown. We, as a nation, sit in an unknown. We do. We do not know where or what we will be by the time this lecture series is over. We don't know, uh, and it's kind of funny, but it's not at all funny, where or what will be when I'm done in an hour. We really don't know. And I'm running, on, I'm running on a certain level of energy and a certain level of anxiety about that. So my wife left 
uh, to Hawaii for a couple weeks because she needs that sun and warm as, as any normal human being does in the middle of winter. So she left this morning, um, yesterday morning, and so tonight there were some complications with me getting my one son picked up and the other son was picking him up. And so my first older son was supposed to text me and say, I got the younger son, and he didn't text me, which is no big deal. But like the way I'm feeling, it felt like something. And so I texted him and said, hey, do you got Sam, the younger one? And, and he didn't text me back. This was about 10 minutes ago, like before I started 10 minutes ago. So then I called him, and he's like, yeah, I texted you back. Didn't you get it? And I was like, I didn't get it. And I, right after, I kind of yelled at him a little bit, OK? And I, and I look, and there's his text. But maybe in my nervousness, maybe in that edginess, I missed that, right? So we're all running on that right now, all right? Today, I'm going to talk about what I call the National Crucible. Next Tuesday, I'll talk about the nomination roadmaps, the primaries and the caucuses, and how you win a nomination uh, for, for the Democratic Party, a presidential nomination. And then on January 21st, I'll talk about the contenders, by which I mean the people who are still running for the presidency. Um, so this is the set of lectures for the first three. And anybody who's watching on uh, video on this, welcome. Thanks for joining. I just think I'll just say this because it's always on, it's a lot, often on a lot of people's minds. Uh, people will often say, is it okay if I share these lectures with other people? Well, actually, billions have already, so it's fine. Um, and I want to encourage you to. You have made a contribution to come tonight. And me as an educator and someone committed to this work, if this is valuable to you in any way, shape, or form, share it with whoever you want. Okay? So America Democracy and 2020, the National Crucible. Tonight, January 7th, 2020. So where we are where we are, and I mean this politically, of course, not necessarily geographically. What does the political landscape look like? I want to go back in time a little bit to the Democrats in 2009. Just as a quick question, how many of you, I'm going to give you like five seconds to see if you have immediate recall of this, how many of you, right off the top of your head, know where you were on election night 2008. Okay. I know where I was. I was in my home and I was celebrating with various people, one of the best political nights of my life. And then the next night I was given a lecture here and I was sick as a dog because I had emotionally invested so much. I want to come out of this election so damn sick. All right? <laughs> OK? All right? Tem Democrats 2009, let's look at four categories of potential offices that we could look at in terms of political power in this country. Governorships, there's 50 of them in this country if we look at states. State chambers, there's uh, two chambers in every state in this country except Nebraska. Nebraska is a unicameral legislature. Um, so there are 49 states that have two chambers, and I'm only interested in those 49 states for this. So there's 98 potential uh, chambers, houses or senates. Okay? U.S. representatives, there's 435 who vote in the U.S. Congress. And there's 100 U.S. senators, 50 states. How many of all of these did the Democrats hold at the beginning of 2009? Post Barack Obama's election, how many do they hold? 50 governorships, the Democrats held 29. Okay? Three, uh, yeah, three fifths, 60%. How many state chambers out of 98? The Democrats held 58. Just about two thirds, 60%. How many U.S. representatives out of, out of 435? They had 257, which is way over a majority. And how many U.S. Senators did they have in 2009? They had 60. The Democrats had 60. And it required every single one of them to pass the Affordable Care Act. 
because they played by a certain set of rules. It required every one of them because you got to get to 60 votes on certain kinds of legislation. So this is where they were. All right, let's go to 2011. Two years later, one midterm election later, the 2010 election, where were the Democrats in terms of the holding of these offices then? In 2011, they had 20 governorships. They'd lost a third of their governors in one election. How many state chambers did they hold? They had 58 in 2009, they had 38 in 2011. That's a wipeout. How many seats in the U.S. House of Representatives? They had 193, which is uh, 24 short. No, it's uh, 10, 20. Yeah, no, it's 27. It's 24 short of a, of a majority. 25 short of a majority. And how many U.S. Senators? Down from 60, they're at 51. They lost nine Senate seats. Holy crap. So here's a mountaintop experience, and here's, uh, we're down in the valley, and we're lost. We're still hanging on. We still have a majority in the U.S. Senate, but we're really, really in trouble. So what we can conclude, and we could spend all kinds of time on this, but that's not what the focus of the lecture series is on, we could conclude that something happened in here, okay? <laughs> this is the kind of analysis that you have paid for tonight, okay? <laughs> Like, this is what I've got right here. Something happened. What happened? I've given a lot of lectures on what happened there. Uh, a response to the first black president is a big part of it. Um, a level of engagement by the Democrats that dropped dramatically is part of the answer. Um, incredible mobilization of people who opposed the Democrats and President Obama is part of the story. Something happened. In two years, though, the world turned. The world turned. Okay. Today is 2020. It's January 7th, 2020. Where are we at in these numbers? Where are we at? Okay. On governors, we got 20. The Demo we, excuse me. The Democrats have 24. Okay. The Democrats have 24 governorships in this country. That's just slightly less than half. Um, and just to give you a sense of what this time trend has looked like over time, we'll go back to 2004. We could go way back, of course, but we'll look from 2004, which is when George W. Bush was reelected, through 2020, and we'll see the number of that Democratic governors and the number of Republican governors over time. We'll watch the data go this way. And what you'll see first, um, well, the big thing you've got to watch for is here. Right here, the world's going to turn. So this is fairly common in American politics. Back and forth, low, low upper 20s to, to low, low 20s, Democrats and Republicans. That's fairly common, back and forth. But then this becomes a Republican dominance until 2018 when the Democrats uh, post that win in, uh, we begin to win a little bit in 2018, we begin to win in 2019. No, I'm sorry, this is 18, this is 19. The data doesn't quite match it, but it's gotta be because we begin to win a few governorships, we do. Michigan, the Democrats win in Michigan, the Democrats win in Minnesota, the Democrats win in Pennsylvania, in Kansas, a whole bunch of states. So this is 2018, this is 2019 when the Democrats um, gained a seat in Kentucky, okay? But it's still 24 to 26, but now it's like, it's close at least if you're a Democratic fan. But it's been a disaster for a long time. Um, there's one more thing to say as you interpret this data in the next one. A part of this gap, and you're going to see a similar gap when we get to state chambers, lies at the feet of my favorite president, Barack Obama. He and his approach 
They did not invest enough in the states during his presidency, and it hurt. It hurt bad in the political apparatus in those states. How about state chambers? How, where are we at in 2020? We're at 39. Damn. The Democrats are at 39. As, as not much better nine years later. What does this look like over time? Again, these are number of chambers held by each party. 2010, again, is going to be the tectonic moment. That's, that's under Obama, and then boom. So this is still a pretty good, pretty big gap. And the ur growing urban, rural, urban and suburban versus rural divide um, is favoring the Republicans too. Because there's more states that have more rural populations. Um, you can only win so many state chambers in California. <laughs> you can only win two. So it, there might be 38 million people living there, but there's still only two state chambers. U.S. representatives, now the Democrats back in the majority here, 235, because of the efforts in 2018, right? Because of the efforts of many of you in this room in 2018, the Democrats in the majority. And holy shit, if the Democrats didn't have the House right now, right? I mean, holy shit. What does this look like over time? Democrats and Republicans, uh, back and forth. That's under Obama, the big Democratic numbers there. And then uh, in his election, and then large Republican numbers for almost a decade. And then the Democrats regain it in 2018. Okay, this is where it's at right now. So there's clear, if you're a Democratic supporter, clear progress on this that's meaningful. And then how about US senators? Where are we at now? The Democrats have 47. Okay? So they're actually worse than they were in 2011. The Democrats are actually in a worse position. What does this look like over time? Well, actually, it stayed in the Democrats' majority all the way until 2014. So under Obama, it's still a majority, and then in 2014, the Republicans gain control. This is when Mitch McConnell becomes a majority leader. He was minority leader starting in 2007 becomes majority leader when they gain the control of the chamber and starting in 2014 after that election, and the Republicans still have control. Um, so if you, uh, if you actually want to uh, be hard on yourself and really uh, kind of one day kind of uh, take yourself to task for mistakes that we politically have made, if you're a Democratic supporter, the biggest political mistake that you've made in some time was in 2014. The turnout by the Democratic Party in 2014 was the lowest in almost 100 years. And it led to changing of the composition of the Senate, put Mitch McConnell in control. This led to the blocking of Merrick Garland, led to Donald Trump now having appointed one quarter of all federal judges in the Senate. So every election matters, every one. So these are the numbers now. OK, so just to finish up this PowerPoint slide, um, what we've got is two instances with governorships and with the House of Representatives where you would say the Democrats have made progress. They've done something notable, useful on their political behalf in the last nine years. The other two areas you would say, I don't, I don't see really much progress here in terms of gaining control or power. So <clears throat> if we add the U.S. presidency to this, well, they obviously won it in 2009. They were still president in 2011, um, and they're not president now. So on three out of five measures of the most important political power in this country, the Democrats are in a worse position now, not only from 2009, but from 2011, when they were in bad shape. You know how I give lectures. It's always bad to start, OK? All right? And the reason why that is is because I live in the reality-based community. And then I shift to hope, OK? So here's the reality, though. What happened here? We don't know yet. We don't know what's going on here yet. 
If you want to point to the house, then there's your, there's your positive data point. You want to point to Kentucky, where I was honored with a group of folks to go and work on behalf of the governor there to help him be reelected and I mean, to be elected. Um, then, then yeah, and that was a great moment for all of us who were part of that. Then yeah, that's a that's a moment of optimism. But you want to point to the Senate and the judges. You want to point to um, a variety of other things. The data points are not positive for the Democrats. So where are we and what's going on? The the answer is actually to be determined. TBD, to be determined. And so I go back to that sports analogy of we don't know what the outcome is going to be for this country and politically. So there are no guarantees, except there is there's actually one guarantee. The guarantee that if you don't act, things will not go the way you want. If you do act, I don't know if they will. But if you don't, we're fucked. Okay? So let's go back in time to the 1860s, uh, to that new birth, and freedom, new birth of freedom moment uh, when one of our presidents, Abraham Lincoln, gave that address, the context in which he gave it in. And I have, uh, for probably the last 20-ish years of my life, spent a lot of time reading and learning um, and listening uh, about history and patterns and things that I uh, either didn't know about or was relearning. Uh, and I have come to see these as extremely helpful to, for me to kind of gain a stability around today and also to have a sense of the kinds of actions that are useful or helpful historically and the kinds of actions that are useful or helpful today. So I, I, I always kind of live in this synthesis of people before me who have inspired me and have fought for progressive change and are trying to apply it to today. So my wife and I have a running joke. Uh, she reads fiction and I read nonfiction. And my nonfiction is almost always involves somebody dying or who fought for certain things and other people died. She calls it like death lit, okay? <laughs> because there's a, usually those are topics around war or fighting for freedom and, and, and justice, and I'm inspired by that work. So this is gonna, for this lecture, to set the context for today, we're gonna go back to that new birth and freedom moment 1864 is the next presidential election after the Gettysburg Address. It's in the middle of the Civil War. And it was a crucible moment for the United States. Arguably the most crucible moment. I mean, we were in a Civil War. Certainly we know that we, there was no guarantees that, that the country in the Union, as we, it was called then, was gonna come forward through that, okay? And there's a couple dimensions that I want to just highlight from that era, that moment, that time. First of all, there were deep union political divides. The, the, United, the union, which was the, focus, fo the folks fighting to retain the structure of the United States, uh, they were not politically united, not close. So we can look at this in 1860 and look at the 1860 US presidential election. And here are the four candidates who ran for the presidency in 1860. Abraham Lincoln wins all the states that are in red. He wins these northern states, and he wins Oregon and California. The blue, I mean the green, the green is a guy by the name of John Breckinridge, who was the vice president of the United States from 1857 to 1861 under the previous president, and was a, a, a former House member, US House member from Kentucky, Breckinridge wins all the South. Breckinridge ran on a platform of supporting um, the preservation of slavery as well as the expansion of slavery into Western territories. So he wins, he wins all the Southern states. Lincoln runs on a platform of not the abolition of slavery. No, 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 no. Lincoln runs on a platform of no slavery beyond the existing enslavement. That's his platform. 
1860. He wins those northern states. Stephen Douglas is a senator from Illinois who had beaten Abraham Lincoln in 1858 for the U.S. Senate seat there. Douglas runs as a northern Democrat on a, slave, on a platform that is uh, a peace, uh, is a platform that says uh, we're going to maintain saver, slavery in the South, but it's not going to be as expanded as a Breckinridge candidate wants it to be. So it was more, it was an enslavement pro, pro-enslavement position, but it wasn't as expansive. He wins Missouri. He also wins three, half of the electoral votes in New Jersey. And then this guy, uh, I think it's John Bell, runs on a constitutional union platform, which is also pro-enslavement, um, but actually says the U.S. Constitution says nothing about the furtherance of or the ab abolition of enslavement, so we're just going to not deal with it. <laughs> and he wins in Kentucky, in Virginia, and in Tennessee. Eventually, in the Union battle, in the Union, in the Civil War, Missouri will stay in as a state that holds slaves, but fights for the Union. Kentucky will also be a, st a slave and holding state, and will fight for the Union, will stay for the Union, even though it has slaves. Um, now, over here, uh, two small states, Maryland and Delaware, are, are what are called Union states. They stay in the North, but they also vote, they vote for John Breckinridge. And they stay in as slave-holding Union states. So the North, the whole country is obviously very divided, but the North is deeply divided as well. And Lincoln famously says about Kentucky, I can, uh, some, uh, I don't have it, uh, something along the lines of, um, we can win this war, but I can't win it without Kentucky. Something like this. Like Kentucky is seen as such a, symbolic kind of ability to hold that state as this tissue between um, the South and the North. So the North is very divided. You have a series of states who stay in the Union, but nonetheless are pro-enslavement. So this is one of the dimensions that's in play in the Union. Second, the Confederacy had long been hoping for international recognition. They had wanted recognition from France. They had wanted recognition um, from England would have been the Holy Grail to get uh, uh, recognition from them. They had not received it. They eventually would never receive it, but they continued to hope for it with the belief that ultimately if they were to get international recognition as a separate nation, that this would turn the tide of northern opinion against the war. So they were hoping for this even as we go into the election of 1864. Another really important thing is that we have a creation of what are called the U.S. Colored Troops, the USCT. Uh, Beginning with the Emancipation Proclamation, northern, uh, the Northern Union armies begin to open the volunteers and uh, pe people in the ranks to, to African American men. They begin to serve in the Civil War, and they begin to enlist, and they begin to fight, and they begin to fight both first as a, uh, divisions and batteries all by themselves, and then eventually they begin to fight side by side uh, not in the same divisions, but in the same kind of broader, I don't know, the regiments. or They were there at same battles, but not necessarily next to each other, whites and African Americans. But they are fighting and dying for this country. And this is uh, a dynamic that is complicated to northern whites and is enraging to southern whites. And so we have the crucial 1864 presidential election. It's looming. The Southerners think that if, if Lincoln loses, that the next president will be more favorable and they can end this war, that on terms good to the South. And Lincoln and those who want to prosecute the war are convinced that they need to win this election in 1864. In this election, as we start to roll, the, the Republicans, I do that as a shout out to Trump, yes, the Republicans. <laughs> The Republicans were internally fractured. Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, but there were other Republicans. So it, it, it wasn't just the Republicans versus the Democrats in the North. Even the Republicans were internally fractured. The Democrats made it fairly clear that they were going to offer a pro-peace nominee in the North, that if they could, if, if that's going to be who they were going to nominate. And so they were saying to moderates and maybe disgruntled Republicans, like, you vote for us, this war will be over. OK? Um, and the election became make or break. 
Literally, the, ele the election became make or break for the United States of America. This was it. This was it. I would say that's where we're at today. This is it. There's a guy by the name of Samuel Gwynn who's written a book called Hymns of the Republic. Hymns, H-Y-M-N-S. Hymns of the Republic. Um, in which he says this about the final year of the Civil War. That's what the book is about, the final year of the war. The war had defied all expectations of what was supposed to happen or of how or when the end might come. But by the spring of 1864, a single truth had loomed into view. Both sides acknowledged it, I'm sorry, both sides acknowledged it, though they could agree on almost nothing else. The truth was that the outcome of all this bloodshed, the final resolution, now hinged on a single event, the November presidential election in the North. By 1864, Abraham Lincoln had established two nation-defining requirements for peace talks. First, that there could be no consideration of anything less than a full union of American states. There would be no peace that would say, like, you go here and you go here. There was going to be all together. And second, that there could be no slavery in that union. The first condition had always been his view. The second had come into being over time as Lincoln had been pushed by abolitionists, had met and listened to Frederick Douglass and other black leaders, and then came to believe. So half a century, not just the war, but everything that led up to the war, of bitter political fighting came down to an election. And the main goal of both armies was to affect its outcome. If the Union won on the battlefield, Lincoln would be reelected. And if Lincoln was reelected, the North's crushing superiority in money, men, and material would soon triumph in the war. If the Union lost on the battlefield, Lincoln would lose at the polls, and the man who would beat him would be a Democrat elected for the specific purpose of ending the war. Last part. The logic was clear. Northern deaths on the battlefield equaled votes at northern polling stations. In the words of the Daily Constitutionalist in Augusta, Georgia, on January 2, 1864, Every bullet we can send is the best ballot that can be deposited against Lincoln's election. The battlefields of 1864 will drive the polls of this momentous decision. Union diarist George Templeton Strong put it this way, the destinies of the continent for centuries depend in great measure on what we do now. So the United States has been in crucible moments. Previous to the 20th century, in the 20th century, they've been there, and this was one of them. It's a moment that still echoes across this country. In the monuments, in the statues, in the flags, in the ideas, in the divisions, in the racism, it echoes to us. I want to talk about two dimensions that become important in 1864. First, military, and second, the politics, and that'll bring us to today. What happened in 1864, the last year of the war, is that the military battles took up and went up another level. Each side made it more brutal. Each side saw that this was it. This was the Armageddon of the Civil War, that whoever did better on the battlefields in 1864 were going to affect the outcome of the Northern election. That if the North was, the Union was losing on the battlefield, people would say, I'm, I want to, I'm done with Lincoln, you're out. And if the Union was doing well on the battlefield, they'd say, we're, we're with you still. So both sides fought with everything they had. In March, Abraham Lincoln uh, selects Ulysses Grant and gives him army command. Grant had been a hero in the Western theater of the Civil War, 
and Lincoln brings him over to fight in Virginia and on the eastern half. Ulysses Grant was cold-blooded. He killed thousands of troops to win the war because he saw a, a manpower advantage and said, so we will lose thousands, but we have, more to, we have more where they come from. And so on a sheer numbers basis, he would fight battle after battle that were absolutely devastating battles to the north. They would lose thousands more than the south, but they had thousands and thousands and thousands of more. So Ulysses Grant wins the war eventually, and he does it at great cost, great cost to the north, but he wins the war. In the south, the south white southerners are running out of men, and they're enraged by the fact that they are fighting against people that they consider subhuman. And it all comes to a head in April when there's a Confederacy massacre at a fort in Arkansas, Fort Pillow. When there are U.S. colored troops there and Nathan Bedford Forrest, one of the founders of the Klan, the, the post-Civil War Klan, leads the Confederate troops in and they literally massacre the black troops. Hundreds just killed. Even though they were trapped and surrounded and were surrendering, they were massacred at Fort Pillow. The Confederacy saying, if we're going down, we're taking you with us, and we're going to try to make the pain so great for all of you that you're going to quit. In summer, we have a whole set of brutal battles at the Wilderness, in Spotsylvania, at Cold Harbor, in Petersburg and Richmond, in Virginia, and the Mississippi March. We all know about the march from William Tecumseh Sherman from Atlanta to the sea. Sherman did the same march across Mississippi first, from west to east Mississippi. Marched across the state, burned everything in sight, and destroyed it because they, did, they wanted the Southerners to feel all this pain. Like, you want to keep fighting us? We're going to destroy you. It is Sherman who says war is hell, and we're going to make it so. And so Sherman, and who had been in the Western Theater with Grant, and was the right-hand man of Grant, and Grant, Sherman and Grant, go to battle in all of these places, and they're just... The, the, the North is actually losing battles, but is winning because the South is running out of men. There are 280,000 casualties in 1864. There are 700, there are scholars, uh, experts vary in terms of the number of total casualties in the Civil War, but it's between 650,000 and 750,000. So we're talking somewhere between a third and a quarter in that year in 1864 because of the intensity of what those battles and those deaths meant for the election that was upcoming. So the military, it's all out, Armageddon, kill or be killed, exalt, uh, inflict as much pain as possible upon the other side, hoping, the South hoping the North will get discouraged and quit, and the North deciding that we're going to have to exterminate the South, that's how we're gonna to have to win. Politically, there are all kind of political maneuvers going on in the North. Lincoln is up for reelection, but there are lots of people in the Republican Party and on the Democratic side who are trying, who think they can beat Lincoln, okay? In the Republican Party, there are other Republicans who float challenges. The primary one is a guy by the name of uh, the Chief Justice Salmon Chase, who says, I'm, I wanna be president, he's wanted to be president for a long time, and he starts to maneuver and try to, he's going to try to kind of come in behind the back door and starts to build a momentum from him. And Lincoln kind of shuts it down in a very adept, uh, not public way. But there are a whole series of people that are really maneuvering because they think Lincoln is not a good president, that the North is going to fail, and the Republicans, you know, they want to get rid of Lincoln, they want to run a different candidate in, 20, in 1864. 
So the Republicans, there's all this political maneuvering. On the Democrat, uh, I'm sorry, that summer, the Republicans uh, are so concerned that there's internal strife in the Republicans that a slice of the Republicans actually break bread and come together with a group called the War Democrats to form a political party that only runs in one election in the 1864 election called the National Union Ele uh, Party. And this is what Lincoln runs on in 1864. He's not actually a Republican in 1864. He's on a National Union ticket. It is war Democrats, it is Democrats who want to prosecute the war. They're not going to end it. They're going to keep it going. They're going to fight for, America, uh, for the Union. And the Republicans who are in Lincoln's camp, they merge together to form the National Union political party. On the Democratic side, they picked General George McClellan, who had been the lead general for Abraham Lincoln in the North and had disappointed and frustrated Lincoln for a long time because McClellan was uh, uh, lethargic, didn't act, and when he did have uh, action, he often inflated the numbers of troops on the other side and would kind of uh, say that we can't attack them here. And so he was uh, uh, a very respected general, but somebody who never really wanted the war. And the Democrats pick McClellan, and McClellan says, you know, that if you want peace, vote for me. You want peace, vote for me. I know how to bring peace. I'm a general. <laughs> this is actually a very fairly common rhetorical move. He's not saying it in this way, but Pete Buttigieg is essentially saying the same thing. You want to trust somebody who knows about war? Trust someone who's been in war, or at least contributed to kind of analysis of it, okay? The Republicans are so worried that in October they add a new state, <laughs> Nevada. Three electoral votes, but they think it might be the tipping point. They add Nevada. In fact, I probably am gonna, this is probably not true, okay, okay? <laughs> No, it is true, but the exact specifics of this probably aren't. The, it, I believe in Gwynn's book, I read that the, Democrat, uh, the Republicans wanted Nevada so badly that the most expensive up to this time telegraphic transmission uh, that had been ever done at this point in time was the Nevada Constitutional Convention telegraphing their new convention, uh, their new constitution to the US Congress. So that it got there within hours so that the US Congress, because they, they are the ones who make the decisions about a state. They needed that constitution in order to make that decision. They literally get added, I think, the last Monday of October. The, Democrat, the Republicans are so worried they, need it, they add a new state. In early autumn, there are three key Union military victories. There's a victory in Mobile, Alabama, where a famous Admiral Farragut wins. There's a victory in Atlanta where William Sherman wins. And there's a victory in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia where a general by the name of Philip Sheridan wins. All three of these are key, obviously, in the South, Mobile, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, Shenandoah Valley. And th this one is on September 1st. Mobile, I believe, is in late August. And Shenandoah Valley kind of encompasses a, a bit of time over there. Those three victories by the Republicans are turning points. All summer long, when you read Abraham Lincoln's correspondence and diary, he is convinced he's going to lose. I'm going to lose. We are going to lose. And so he sets out a whole series of things to make it that, so that formerly enslaved people will be treated certain ways if slavery still remains in this country, that the former enslaved who have come north uh, will be treated as free. That people who have been uh, freed from the south as part of military will be treated, not by any remote stretch of the imagination, well, but not returned to slavery. He sets out a whole host of policies that he hopes will carry the day and re remain after he's expecting to lose. But these victories become crucial in turning momentum, and Lincoln wins re-election. He wins re-election in 2000, I'm sorry, in 1864. <laughs> and he carries the North, the whole North. Abraham Lincoln is the first Northern president 
in US history to be reelected. Before that, every two-time president had been a Southerner. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, Andrew Jackson. Those have been the four two-term presidents before Abraham Lincoln. They're all the first three from Virginia and the fourth from Tennessee. Lincoln is the first Northern president to be reelected. And it took the division of the country so that he won reelection solely because it was just the North. It was just the North. He wins reelection. That's the story of that crucible moment. That country, this country, the, Ameri the United States of America hung together by those threads at that time. People died. People fought for their freedoms. People fought against those freedoms. So a new birth of freedom. It's the words Lincoln uses, or part of the words he uses in the Gettysburg Address. In 2007, Barack Obama announced his candidacy for the presidency of the United States. And with deep strategic intention, he sought to invoke the legacy of Abraham Lincoln. In 2007, when he announced his candidacy, he gave his launch speech on the front, from the front patio steps of the old state capitol in Springfield, Illinois. The old state capitol is where Abraham Lincoln in 1858 had given the house divided speech. And Springfield, Illinois is Abraham Lincoln's hometown. You go to Springfield, Illinois, there is Lincoln everything. Obama went there, and on a freezing day in February 2007, announced his candidacy, invoking Abraham Lincoln and invoking the better angels of our nature, saying we can and must do better. We need to better. Over the course of his campaign, Barack Obama begins to talk about a new birth of freedom. On this day, in 2007, 10,000 people came to Springfield, Illinois. It was literally zero degrees. I know, because I was there. When we drove up, the car temperature was zero. And when we got out of the car and walked the many blocks there, there were license plates from everywhere around the country. And that's me. Okay? Right there. I didn't know I was so gray back then, all right? But I, my son verified it. I had him take a close look at it. And why was, I was there because I was inspired by these, this man his family, and because of the ideas, the new birth of freedom. In 2009, when Barack Obama had been elected and was now doing his inaugural, you select a theme for the inaugural. You have a theme that carries through all of the events and all of the days. The inaugural is several days. We just pay attention mostly to the address. But it's many balls and dances. It's many different events. It's a several day affair. It involves the president going to certain places around the country and then ending up in DC um, for the inauguration. So every president picks a theme for their inauguration and it's a theme that is invoked, carried out visually, words wise, environment wise through the entire set of events and activities. Barack Obama's theme was a new birth of freedom. That was his theme for his inauguration. And I want to show you a few words from his address, his inaugural address. And then I'm going to pivot to the map, the literal United States map that we're looking at in 2020. Barack Obama in 2009 
We understand that greatness is never a given. It must be earned. Our journey has never been one of shortcuts or settling for less. It has not been the path for the faint-hearted, for those that prefer leisure over work, or seek only the pleasures of riches and fame. Rather, it has been the risk takers, the doers, the makers of things, some celebrated, but more often men and women obscure in their labor, who have carried us up the long, rugged path towards prosperity and freedom. For us, for us, they packed up their few worldly possessions and traveled across oceans in search of a new life. For us, they toiled in sweatshops and settled the West, endured the lash of the whip, and plowed the hard earth. For us, they fought and died in places like Concord and Gettysburg, Normandy and Quezon. Now, there are some who question the scale of our ambitions in this new century. Their memories are short, for they have forgotten what this country has already done, what free men and women can achieve when imagination is joined to common purpose and necessity to courage. In the face of our common America, in the face of our common dangers, in this winter of our hardship, let us remember our timeless values. With hope and virtue, let us brave once more the icy currents and endure what storms may come. Let it be said by our children's children that when we were tested, we refused to let this journey end, that we did not turn back, nor did we falter. And with eyes fixed on the horizon and God's grace upon us, we carried forth that great gift of freedom and delivered it safely to future generations. Now, I have read every presidential inaugural, and they are, they are um, un generally very upbeat and positive speeches. This is a sobering speech. Donald Trump will take it to another level in 2016 in a harrowing speech, okay? But in 2009, on the eve of this moment, with two million people gathered in Washington, D.C., this is a president who spoke up in the face of our common dangers in this winter of our hardship. I think he understood. I think he fucking understood. In the same way that I think Lincoln understood in 1863. The new birth of freedom is one for every generation to fight for and to work for. And I'm struck, and I want you to be struck, please, by these words. Let it be said by our children's children that when we were tested, we refused to let this journey end, that we did not turn back, nor did we falter, and with eyes fixed on the horizon and God's grace upon us, we carried forth that great gift of freedom and delivered it safely to future generations. The 2020 map. It is a reality in American politics that not all states are created equal in elections. Some states matter more for national politics. They matter more because of the number of electoral college votes. That'll be lecture one, act two, the electoral college. Sometimes they matter more because of the place they are in the country um, and what that symbolizes, sometimes they matter more because they're politically divided and that election, that state could go different ways. So it is a cold, a clear-eyed reality to look at this, the map and say some states matter more than others. And in the 2020 map, it is m my conclusion and the, co the work of colleagues that I have the privilege to work with that these are the states that matter the most politically. Washington is on this map mostly because we live here, okay? And so I hate, you know, you paid a nice fee to come to these lectures. I didn't want to tell you that like we don't give it, it doesn't matter, right? But we matter 
also at the US House level, there's some important US House races in the state. Um, and we, we matter, we're great, okay, just so we're clear. <laughs> but mostly politically, it is these blue states around the country that will decide who controls, who wins the presidency, who has a majority in the US Senate, who has a majority in the US House. Those three things. These states are the ones that will mostly decide that. All of these states, or some good chunk of these states, also have really important state races. State legislature races, state Supreme Court races. So it is my conviction, in the body of work that colleagues and I are, are doing, that these are the states that we need to invest as much time as possible. Not when possible, but as much as possible. Like changing jobs to do this. Like setting aside money to do this. Like saying goodbye to my family and my friends for weeks on time, possible. In 1864, they gave it everything they had. In 1941 and two and three and four and five, they gave it everything they had. Some of you in this room gave it everything you had in Vietnam. You certainly know people that have done it in those spaces in those places, the least I can do is to give it all that we can give it. So in all of these states, they are either key presidential states or they are key U.S. Senate states or there are really important U.S. House races in those states. It's 18 states. 18 states. If you want to be involved, if you want to be part of this, we're going to have opportunities for you. This is the map. This is what we're doing. This is where we're going. This is my motto. Democracy is not a noun, it is a verb. It does not happen, it does not get sustained, it does not get lengthened, it does not remain unless we are going to act as sure as they did in 1864, as sure as people have before us. We're gonna do nine lectures, they're all gonna be just like this because the times call for it. I invite you, I ask you, I encourage you to come along in this journey. I'm honored that you're here. We gotta go, it's 2020, let's go. Thank you tonight. <laughs>